Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just coming to you today, talk to you a little bit about the third commandment. And I thought that it'd be helpful for us to just study what it is uh, to follow the Sabbath day, to honor it. And in times of of crises and times of turmoil and times of a pandemic like we find ourselves in, what does it mean to keep the third commandment? I don't want to just talk off the top of my head here, so I thought it'd be good for us to look at Martin Luther's large catechism and read what he has to say. There we hear him say, You shall sanctify the holy day. The word holiday is used for the Hebrew word Sabbath, which properly means to rest, that is, to cease from labor. Therefore, we usually say to stop working or sanctify the Sabbath. Now, in the Old Testament, God set apart the seventh day and appointed it for rest. He commanded that it should be regarded as holy above all other days. This commandment was given only to the Jewish people for this outward obedience, that they should stop toilsome work and rest. In that way, both man and beast might recover and not be weakened by endless labor. Later, the Jewish people restricted the Sabbath too closely and greatly abused it. They defamed Christ and could not endure in him the same works that they themselves would do on that day, as we read in the Gospel, Matthew 12. They acted as though the commandment were fulfilled by doing no manual work whatsoever. This, however, was not the meaning, but, as we shall hear, they were supposed to sanctify the holy day, or day of rest. This commandment, therefore, in its literal sense, does not apply to us Christians. It is entirely an outward manner, like other ordinances of the Old Testament. The ordinances were attached to particular customs, persons, times, and places, but now they have been made matters of freedom through Christ. Colossians 2. The simple-minded need to grasp a Christian meaning about what God requires in this commandment. Note that we don't keep holy days for the sake of intelligent and learned Christians. They have no need of holy days. We keep them first of all for bodily causes and necessities, which nature teaches and requires. We keep them for common people, manservants and maidservants, who have been attending to their work and trade the whole week. In this way, they may withdraw in order to rest for a day and be refreshed. Second, and most especially on this day of rest, since we can get no other chance, we have the freedom and time to attend divine service. We come together to hear and use God's word, and then to praise God, to sing, and to pray. However, this keeping of the Sabbath, I point out, is not restricted to a certain time, as with the Jewish people. It does not have to be just on this or that day, for in itself no one day is better than another. Instead, this should be done daily. However, since the masses of people cannot attend every day, there must be at least one day in the week set apart. From ancient times, Sunday, the Lord's Day, has been appointed for this purpose. So, we also should continue to do the same, in order that everything may be done in an orderly way. And no one may create disorder by starting unnecessary practices. This is the simple meaning of the commandment. People must have holidays. Therefore, such observances should be devoted to hearing God's word so that the special function of this day of rest should be the ministry of the word for the young and the mass of poor people. Yet the resting should not be strictly understood to forbid any work that comes up, which cannot be avoided. So, when people, when someone asks you, what is meant by the commandment, you shall sanctify the holy day, answer like this, to sanctify the holy day is the same as to keep it holy, but what is meant by keeping it holy? Nothing else than to occupy, be occupied with holy words, works, and life, 
For the day needs no sanctification for itself. It has been created wholly in itself. But God desires the day to be holy to you. Therefore it becomes holy or unholy because of you, whether you are occupied on that day with things that are holy or unholy. How then does such sanctification take place? Not like this, sitting behind the stove and doing no rough work, or adorning ourselves with a wreath and putting on our best clothes, but as said above, we occupy ourselves with God's word and exercise ourselves in the word. Instead, we Christians ought always to keep such a holy day and be occupied with nothing but holy things. This means we should daily be engaged with God's word and carry it in our hearts and upon our lips. But as said above, since we do not always have free time, we must devote several hours a week for the sake of the young, or at least a day for the sake of the entire multitude, to being concerned about this alone. We must especially teach the use of the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, and so direct our whole life and being according to God's Word. At whatever time, then, this is being observed in practice, there a true holy day is being kept. Other things shall not be called a Christian's holy day. For indeed, non-Christians can also stop working and be idle, just as the entire swarm of our church workers do. They stand daily in the churches singing and ringing bells, but they do not keep a holy day in true holiness because they do not preach or use God's word, but teach and live contrary to it. God's word is the sanctuary above all sanctuaries. Yes, it is the only one we Christians know and have. Though we had the bones of all the saints or all the holy and consecrated garments on a heap, still that would not be help to us at all. All that stuff is a dead thing that can sanctify no one, but God's word is the treasure that sanctifies everything. By the word, even all the saints themselves were sanctified. Whenever God's word is taught, preached, heard, read, or meditated upon, then the person, day, and work are sanctified. This is not because of the outward work, but because of the word, which makes saints of us all. Therefore, I constantly say that all our life and work must be guided by God's word, if it is to be God-pleasing or holy. Where this is done, this commandment is in force and being fulfilled. On the contrary, Any observance or work that is practiced without God's word is unholy before God. This is true no matter how brilliantly a work may shine, even though it is covered with relics such as the fictitious spiritual orders, which know nothing about God's word and seek holiness in their own works. Note, therefore, that the force and power of this commandment lies not in the resting, but in the sanctifying, so that a special holy exercise belongs to this day. For other works and occupations are not properly called holy exercises unless the person is holy first. But here a work is to be done by which a person is himself made holy. This is done, as we have heard, only through God's word. For this reason, particular places, times, persons, and the entire outward order of worship have been created and appointed so that there may be order in public practice. So much depends upon God's word. Without it, no holy day can be sanctified. Therefore, we must know that God insists upon a strict observance of this commandment and will punish all who despise his word and are not willing to hear and learn it, especially at the time appointed for the purpose. It is not only the people who greatly misuse and desecrate the holy day who sin against this commandment. Those who neglect to hear God's word because of their greed or frivolity or lie in taverns and are dead drunk like swine. But even that other crowd sins. They listen to God's word like it was any other trifle and only come to preaching because of custom. They go away again, and at the end of the year they know as little of God's word as at the beginning. Up to this point the opinion prevailed that you had properly hallowed Sunday when you had heard a mass or the gospel read. 
but no one cared for God's word and no one taught it. Now that we have God's word, we fail to correct the abuse. We allow ourselves to be preached to and admonished, but we do not listen seriously and carefully. Know therefore that you must be concerned not only about hearing, but also about learning and retaining God's word in memory. Do not think that this is optional for you or of no great importance. Think that it is God's commandment who will require an account of you about how you have heard, learned, and honored his word. Likewise, those fussy spirits are to be rebuked who, after they have heard a sermon or two, find hearing more sermons to be tedious and dull. They think that they know all that well enough and need no more instruction. For that is exactly the sin that was previously counted among mortal sins and is called Acadia. This is a malignant, dangerous plague with which the devil bewitches and deceives the hearts of many so that he may surprise us and secretly take God's word from us. Let me tell you this. Even though you know God's word perfectly and are already a master in all things, you are daily in the devil's kingdom. He ceases neither day nor light night to sneak up on you and to kindle in your heart unbelief and wicked thoughts against these three commandments and all the commandments. Therefore, you must always have God's word in your heart, upon your lips, and in your ears. But where the heart is idle and the word does not make a sound, the devil breaks in and has done the damage before we are aware. On the other hand, the word is so effective that whenever it is seriously contemplated, heard, and used, it is bound never to be without fruit. It always awakens new understanding, pleasure, and devoutness, and produces a pure heart and pure thoughts. For these words are not lazy or dead, but are creative, living words. And even though no other interest or necessity moves us, this truth ought to urge everyone to the word, because thereby the devil is put to flight and driven away. Besides, this commandment is fulfilled, and this exercise in the word is more pleasing to God than any work of hypocrisy, however brilliant. So that's what this large catechism has to say about the Sabbath day, and I think it's, it's really helpful. I think it's good for us to pause for a moment and just listen to and, and reflect upon again this Um, this teaching from Martin Luther. I think he's hitting on something important here, that it's not about what we do or don't do that makes the Sabbath day holy. It is what God is doing. And the purpose of giving us a holiday, a rest, a Sabbath, is that God might do among us his sanctifying work, that the devil might be put at bay that what Luther fears the most is that on any any calendar day of the month or year, any idleness, any ceasing to reflect upon the word of God gives the devil opportunity to attack Christians. And one of the things that we are wrestling with right now is all right, so in order to keep the Sabbath day, does that mean that we have to be in a physical church building? And I think Luther would say, and I certainly would say, no, technically, you do not have to be in a physical church building in order to keep the Sabbath day. That really, while you're at work, while you're at play, whatever you're doing When you reflect upon God's word, it is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to sanctify you, to defend you against Satan, and consecrate this time, this space unto himself, so that you can find rest and peace in the Lord. But one of the things Luther isn't addressing, because it wasn't even possible for him at that time, was, is it possible for a Christian to hear the word of God apart from the physical building of the church? 
And that's where we have a new context that we have to wrestle with. It is possible for us. You may be listening to this podcast, for instance. You don't have to be in my office to hear me speaking to you. And so you can be at home and you can hear people preaching the word of God. You can tune in to the church and that can be a Sabbath day. So strictly speaking, I think we have to confess, no, you do not have to be in the church building in order to keep the Sabbath day. However, when we read elsewhere in scripture that it is a Christian's obligation and responsibility to not neglect meeting together, there is the commands of Christ and the apostles that remind us that to be the church, to be the ecclesia, are, is to be the people of God called out and called together, collected together. We are a communion of saints. And God didn't do this just haphazardly, but he intends that we would hear the word of God together and that we would repeat the word of God together. In the words of the liturgy, we, we hear one another's voices and we, we are affirming the truth of God's word together. And it, it gives us strength because there is strength in numbers and our faith is bolstered because not only am I hearing this word, but my neighbor's hearing this word and we're repeating back, this is what God has promised. And, and that encourages us. And then we sing songs together. And that, that also like, is a way in which God has provided to supernaturally defend us against the attacks of Satan. And I know from the couple of weeks where we didn't meet at Easter time, when I was pre-recording the services and then went back home and would watch them on Sunday with my family, like that, that's legitimate. God's word is being preached there, but there is a, a major uh, deficit also in what's going on because it isn't it isn't the whole church gathered together it isn't our voices blending together and we might not even like the way that we sound when we're singing at home and so we just choose not to sing at all and and so little by little satan has these opportunities to just make make uh the Sabbath day and the rest and the peace, the sanctuary of it all, less than. And it may be true that we can, we can live with that for a while, but as we stretch into six months now, I think the, the negative impact that it is having on, on a lot of people is quite severe and serious. And the question isn't really is this is this negatively impacting me that should never be the the christian's question it's not about just you right we have to say is is my absence from the gathered congregation is that is that harming other people you may not be experiencing anxiety attacks and the like but there may be people in the sanctuary that when they look around and and don't see you, and don't have the gifts of, of your voice and your presence are, are not as protected and defended against Satan as they could be. Because there isn't any one of us that are members of a church that are, that are irrelevant. Like Each one of us matter, and, and that's part of the danger of this this hybrid system of some in person and and some virtual is that we're starting to get used to it and what i want to do by studying the large catechism here on on the sabbath day is not to bring a law to people and be like shame on you you're breaking the sabbath day or anything like that but to affirm the gifts of god and what he's doing it the the opportunity that we have as the people of God to be to be knit together in his presence and to be reminded 
And that's so much about what what Christianity is. It's a remembering. It's a doing things in remembrance of not just a fond like thinking back on something, but that as we as we say the words of God back to him, they become a reality for us collectively as a group. And we we spit those words back in the face of Satan as he's trying to attack us and as he's trying to attack our friends. And we're saying, you, you will not succeed, Satan. This is a Sabbath day. This is, this is a holy day. I do not make it holy unto myself. But God, God with his presence has chosen to once again sanctify us with his word and strengthen us so that we can be a new people and so that we can overcome the the trials of this world. And the trials of this world are great right now and the anxieties are, are pressing. And so it's important more now than ever that we have a holiday, that we have a Sabbath, that we have a rest from the the cacophony of bad news and of Satan's pressure to try and and destroy our hope. We are not a people without hope. We are an Easter people. We are a Sabbath day people. The psalm says, Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where glory dwells. Think about that. Loving the habitation of God's house We love that God has chosen to be present in his house, in his people. And we are the house of God. We are his holy temple. He has deigned to dwell among us and he has given us his Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so in all that we do, and especially when we're gathered together, when all of the different pieces and walls and roof and all of it comes together as the house of God, the people of God gathered in this place. That's the habitation of the Lord. And I love that habitation. All Christians love that habitation, the place where his glory dwells. As we approach the word and the sacraments, we behold the glory. The glory of the Son is that he gave his life so that everyone might have forgiveness of sins, that we might have life in his name. Remembering the Sabbath day is the third commandment. But as Jesus has fulfilled the law perfectly for us, this commandment has become Also a promise, a a grace-filled promise that says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. I am remembering it, says God to us. I, I remember that I have promised to be with you, to never leave or forsake you. I've made my habitation among you. I am making the day holy. And because I've invited you into my house, I am making you holy. And I'm dwelling among you so that you might have have life and you might have a foretaste of the life to come. And by partaking of the table, you you have a foretaste of the feast to come. A feast in God's presence where he delights in you, his his invited guests. So as we conclude today, I just want us to to give thanks. To give thanks for the opportunity that we have as God's people to worship together without fear, to come into his presence and know that we're not going to be turned away, that the doors are open. I don't want to place false guilt on anyone. There are certainly sick people among us that need to be extra careful right now. But I also pastorally have a responsibility to admonish those of us that don't have these these extra sicknesses to not forsake the gathering together because there is so much good in the gathering together for us and for the whole people of God, for our community, that, that this gift is something that we, we celebrate week in and week out is, is just a marvelous thing. And with the, with the psalmist, we can say, Lord, 
I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. I can't wait to be there again. Thanks for listening.